And we are live. Thank you for um, uh, joining us today. We're a couple minutes behind. Sorry about that. Um, glad we're here with you tonight. Welcome to Red Hoop Talk. I'm Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and also the executive director and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs, the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country. Um, I am coming to you from the lands of the Piscataway people and um, wondering uh, uh, what everyone's going to be thinking about on uh, tomorrow on Martin Luther King Day. Uh, this isn't the greatest time uh, that we're experiencing as a country right now. And I was talking with one of our guests earlier this evening and, and saying, what, what's some good news stories? What, what are some good news stories? What's going on that's good? And um, not, uh, we were having trouble kind of pulling out those good news stories in Indian country. I think there's a couple, but um, you know, what's going on uh, with race and anti-racism and uh, with our uh, government right now, uh, is, is, uh, well, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that tomorrow is Martin Luther King day. And I hope we all take a moment, uh, to come together and, uh, think about where we would like this country to go. Uh, because I think it's in, in the power of that connected thought that we can actually create, uh, a, a new and better reality for all of us. Um, all right, enough of my whatever that is. Uh, I guess I had too much sage tonight. Um, but <laughs> I want to tell you that Roy is not with us tonight. He couldn't join us because he had some family commitments pop up unexpectedly. Um, but, you know, that's what you, you know, when you have a blonde wife, that's just, you know, how it goes. <laughs> Uh, Stacy's going to kill me. Okay. Anyway, um, welcome everyone to the chat room. I see some friends and, and some regulars. Hello. Hello, Shannon Martin. Um, uh, Buju and uh, Lance, our friend Lance uh, in the Southwest. I think, I think Lance, that's you're in the Southwest still. Um, happy that, that you all are with us. Please be free and feel comfortable to tell us who you are, uh, where you're calling from or listening in. I, this isn't a phone show. Uh, I still can't get used to this. Um, we are coming to you uh, through Facebook, through YouTube, and through Twitter. Um, and we get comments from all three of those platforms that we get to respond and interact to. So please don't uh, be a stranger. Let us know that you're there. And we have a really great show tonight. I've got two people who've been working in Indian country, both in urban and, uh, you know, out there on the res uh, along with me. And we're going to share our stories about what it's like working in Indian country and, and doing our best to stay close to culture and, and uh, staying out of the bad eyesight of our aunties. Right. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for us, you don't hesitate to ask. Uh, some of the news going on uh, this week, some of the good news. I was trying to look up, uh, look it up. It was hard to find with all the the, the crap going on. But there was a, a Shoshone Bannock case that, that came up um, that was, I actually don't have the article in front of me, but it was actually the one good thing, uh, one good court decision that came up that was in support of the tribe. If someone has any facts, let me know what those are. Um, but we've got the Apache stronghold who are still fighting uh, for the rights to Oak Flat and those sacred sites and places that are there against Rio Tinto and, and some of the mining organizations that are in partnership with Rio Tinto there. Um, still fighting that fight, still there. Um, and I'm so grateful that there are people in, in Indian country who are willing to um, take a stand and put their bodies in those places uh, to make sure people uh, uh, will protect those those areas. Um, so please um, let us know if, if you're out there. Let us know if you're helping and supporting them. Um, coronavirus is still kicking our ass. Uh, uh, I don't think IHS's numbers are, are, are worth much because they're so limited. But IHS has 
tested as of January 15th, about 1.8 million uh, natives, about 166,000 of those have tested positive. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Navajo Nation and, and some other nations that are reporting their numbers in the media are still going up. Um, we're not doing better. I'm hearing of more and more deaths, um, but I'm also hearing stories of recovery. Uh, so if you have any of that to share, please do so. Hey, JD. Hey, Joey. Hey, everyone in our chat room. So glad you're there. I'm going to um, uh, shut up because I, I don't think you came here for me. I think you came here for our guests and a little bit of fun and joy for a Sunday evening. So let me bring up our, our folks here with us tonight. Um, let me pop them up first and then we'll, then we'll talk. Doom, doom, look at, look at Hello. it. Hey everybody. So we have River Kerstetter is Oneida and uh, Colleen Medicine is from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. And guess what? All three of us are connected because all three of us are uh, working with now with the Association on American Indian Affairs. River is helping us with public affairs and outreach. Colleen is our new uh, program director. Um, so we have we have the team here. Um, and I told them, I told both of you, so so you got to affirm this. So uh, everyone knows I'm not just like strong arming you guys. They're here voluntarily. <laughs> I told them that, that we didn't have to talk about work um, <laughs> yes. uh, and that this d didn't go on any kind of performance evaluation or anything like this. This is this is completely unscripted and they can say whatever they want. Um, right. Isn't that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in honor of the both of you, before we get into our show tonight, I wanted to give you both a little gift. Um, so if you would, um, um, there's Shannon. Hi, Shannon. She said hi to both of you. Um, can you all see uh, the chat yeah. and everyone on the Hello, chat? Shannon. <laughs> yes, I can see it now. Okay. Well, I want to give you, if I still have it up, let me find it. I wanted to share something with you all. Um, Yes, there it is. So let me let me get here and then I'm gonna share screen and and share this with you. Okay, here we go. Here's here's my gift to you. A bunch, let's see, a bunch of old white guys. No, okay. She's <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I gotta play the video. Gotta play it. We are circling, circling together. We are singing, singing our heart song. This is family, this is unity, this is celebration, this is we are circling, circling together. We are singing, singing in our hearts. Don't this is family. This is unity. This is celebration. This is celebration. We are circling, circling together. We are singing, singing a heart song. This is family, this is unity, this is celebration, this is sacred. We are spinning, spinning all together. We are singing over the rainbow, this is harmony. This is unity. This is celebration. This is We are circling, 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 
We are spiraling like a bending to wither. Baby, elders, bows, 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 and angels. This is how we grow. grow. This, this is how, how we get, get to know. This is the celebration. This is the same. We are circling, circling together. We are singing, singing our hearts off. This is family, this is unity, this is celebration, this is sacred. We are circling, circling, we are singing, 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 this is celebration. This is celebration. This is Hey, y'all. <laughs> hey, are we back on? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So that is my gift to you. I was thinking about you all today and, and thinking of how I could really bring you into the show tonight. And so that's that's what came to mind, old uh, wise Buffy St. Marie. Thank you. She's just the coolest person. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, uh, you know, but, but she's expensive to bring to the association. I have, so I have to play her YouTube videos, but, but regardless, Welcome. Thank you for for joining us tonight. So so let's get into it. Like um, River Colleen, how did y'all? How were you born? How did, how did you get here? What happened in between? Um, where you come from? Uh, who wants to start? I could start. <laughs> um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is River. Um, I'm a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, which is one of the three uh, major Oneida communities um, after many of us were uh, removed from New York. But um, I'm Wisconsin Oneida. Um, I grew up in Pueblo lands, what is called Albuquerque. Um, and now I live in Potawatomi lands, what we call Chicago. Um, I've lived here for about six years. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm an artist, I'm a writer. Um, I hesitate to call myself an organizer a lot of the time, but I, I support a lot of organizing in Chicago um, and organizers. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. Um, I'm sure you know there's there's more to say, but um, oh, we'll that's get into the, it. <laughs> what do you say? I said we'll get into it. Yes, we'll, we'll get, get into, into it. it. But that's my that's my quick intro. And yeah, I'm excited to to be chatting with y'all tonight. So Colleen, tell us about yourself. Well, uh, miigwech, uh, Shannon and River, Ani Bujo, Wapshka Sinikwe Indigenous Cause, Segana and Donja Ba, Bawating Dada, Danja Bomcock Makina Minising, Mishiki and Dodem, Ojibwe and Anishinaabe Queen Dao. So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is, my English name is Colleen Medicine. Um, what I said in my introduction, my spirit name is White Rock Woman. And um, I uh, was born, my heart first sounded in Saginaw, Michigan, but now I'm here um, in what we call Bawating, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And uh, my my people come from uh, Mackinac Island, Michigan, and I'm Turtle Clan. So. I'm coming to you uh, tonight from the UP of Michigan um, here in Bawating lands. I'm Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, and um, uh, I grew up in St. Ignace, Michigan, just a little ways down the road here. So I've been all over the UP here. Um, it's interesting always working with um, uh, people like Shannon and River because they're um, used to bigger cities and bigger places, and I live i um, in this little tiny place in the UP of Michigan. So um, the Anishinaabe have been here since time immemorial. And of course, um, so we uh, we are here in Anishinaabe Aki in the UP of Michigan. So that's my introduction. I'm happy to be here tonight and looking forward to some good discussion. Yeah, 
me Gwetch and me you. Ooh, thank y'all. Thank um, you. All right. It's funny, Colleen, I'm Turtle Clan too, through my grandmother. Yes. Oh my <laughs> we and relatives. I love that. <laughs> I have to be careful about that because my family were called deer killers. So like I can't, I gotta be careful that nobody's in the deer clan <laughs> or they may not like me right from the beginning if I tell them that. <laughs> so, so you all have, you all have, um, I'm trying to, I, I wanna know about the commonalities and also um, the differences. Um, River, where did, where were you? You were raised in uh, Albuquerque in, in, in New Mexico area. Your tribe yeah. is your tribe is uh, Oneida, Wisconsin, um, and so what was that like for you to kind of be separate? When did you go back? Um, yeah, yeah. So I so my family ended up in um, just outside of Albuquerque um, because, like, of a lot. I always trace it back to my grandparents' journey. Um, on my dad's side, they, um, my grandma is Oneida. My grandpa was white. Um, it was the forties. So they, uh, got out of town <laughs> when they decided to get married. Um, and I can only, uh, you know, imagine the reasoning for that, but they, um, s were in Connecticut for a while. And then, um, my grandma decided to study traditional pottery. And so they ended up in New Mexico. So she partly, uh, so she could meet other native potters there because there's a lot more uh, potters in the Southwest. Um, and she also went to um, the Institute of American Indian Arts. So that's kind of what drew them there. And then, you know, my dad was born there and then, or not born there, sorry, but he spent most of his childhood there. And then I was born there. So that's kind of how I came to be in New Mexico. <clears throat> and then, yeah, I mean, growing up, it was this, um, my pet, you know, my parents, my family, my grandmother um, really instilled like a sense of pride of being Oneida, even though we were distant. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that um, because I always felt like a, a connection. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was weird at times, you know, and growing up, I had a lot of questions of like, well, you know, what does this mean to be so far um, from our, from our homelands in, in New York? And then, um, you know, also our community in, in Wisconsin. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't really go back a lot um, until I was an adult and I said, why have we never gone back? Like I've always wanted to go back and I didn't really, uh, it didn't occur to me as a kid that I could like ask for that, you know? Mm -hmm. So as an adult, I was like, I, right, okay, I'm going back. So started visiting my grandma more as an adult. And um, it's partly why I like Chicago because it's just a, a couple hours from the res. It's like a four hour drive. Right. <laughs> um, and to Lance who just asked me red or green, um, which is a, common New Mexico question, red chili or green chili. I am a Christmas <laughs> person. I like both um, at the same time. Uh, but yeah, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just saying like, I, uh, part of why I was drawn to Chicago is because it was closer to the res. Um, and yeah, I think one of the, the, I don't know if it's like funny or just kind of was surreal growing up was like, I was surrounded by indigenous culture in New Mexico by Pueblo and, you know, Apache and Navajo culture. Um, but like, so I felt like kinship, you know, to, to, you know, our peoples. Um, but I was so far from Oneida that it was kind of like, huh, sometimes this made me, sometimes it made me feel lonely because it was like surrounded by indigenous people, but not my tribe. Um, and so that was, 
that was, I think, weird, you know, looking back, like that was a, a unique uh, perspective that has really made me value community now and being closer to my Wisconsin family. So, so did you yeah. feel in, but not really in? <laughs> Like, it was like, yeah, it was like there were moments where I felt that kinship. Like my dad would say, okay, we're, you know, we got invited to feast day at Jemez Pueblo. So we'd jump in the truck and drive over there and eat all day and, and feel very loved. Um, there were other times where I didn't feel like I fit in because, um, you know, kids in high school would be like, you don't look native. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know. I think a lot of us get that, but it was like, well, I don't look like you. That's what you maybe mean. <laughs> um, and I know my, my, my dad and my aunt got that too when they were kids growing up in New Mexico. So yeah, sometimes I felt like I fit in. Sometimes I didn't. Yeah. Um, and, and Colleen, yeah. you've been where you were, where you are, where you all y'all continue to be, <laughs> right? I mean, you've been um, in your homelands pretty much um, and uh, uh, continue to be there and have, have worked for your tribe. Uh, what What is that like? Yeah, well, what's interesting about where I grew up is I started um, my journey growing up on Mackin Island. So, that's um, where uh, I lived for, I think, the first five or six years of my life. And then we moved off the island. And um, what we call is the mainland, which is really uh, St. Ignace. So um, still um, right in the heart of Anishinaabeaki. Um, um, but what is interesting, um, but also a little similar to like growing up, um, feeling a little bit lonely or removed rivers that here in this area had over 500 years of contact and um, Bawating or Sault Ste. Marie where I'm at now is the second city um, in the U.S. to be formed. So um, lots of um, lots of our, our culture and our life ways was wiped out long ago and I think our communities are really struggling to find that as most are um, but I think here it seemed like even though um, we were here right in, in um, the midst of, of where um, the Anishinaabe are, it still felt like um, we didn't get to grow up with as much culture or traditions as I think we would have liked. And um, so that I've been kind of on my path to to relearn those things. And as um, uh, Shannon Martin likes to say, uh, reactivate those things. Mm -hmm. I love that. I always say the three R's, reactivate, repatriate, and revitalize. So mm -hmm. um, on, on my path, um, I found myself um, in college and then found my way back up here um, to work for my own tribe. And um, when I was a child, everyone wanted to know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I want to work for my tribe. That was my dream. It was, <laughs> that was it. Just, I wanted to work for my tribe. And so when I graduated, I came back up here. I did a small stint in our education department. And then I moved over to our cultural department, um, which is uh, now our language and cultural department. So I've been working there for collectively, I think about eight years. And I did a small little um, stint at our Intertribal Council of Michigan working on an opioid, a uh, perinatal opioid grant. And then went back over to the tribe. So done a little moving around and, um, but always working in Indian country. So that's been my passion. I think since I was a kid, I wanted to work for the people. And so um, that's kind of where, what led me to, I guess at this moment, so. Yes, yes. It's amazing. Uh, oh my gosh, my head was going in 10 different directions and now I've, I'm forgetting which one I should, I should go down next. <laughs> um, uh, it's interesting that you talked about, uh, uh, can you say it again? The re uh, reactivate, reactivate, right. Um, I had an elder, um, that, you know, people would come to him and, and say, you know, I want, I want to get back on my path. I, uh, my, my mother, my grandmother was in boarding school or, um, you know, I live in the city now. I'm not back in, in my home and I need to get back on my path. I need, I need to, you know, get back involved in ceremony. I need to do all these things. And he said, well, first breathe, first breathe. 
<laughs> and then the second was you have, no matter where you are, you have everything you need within you. Mm. All you have to do is remember. It's in our DNA. It's there, right? And so that would always help me no matter where I've been, you know, whether there's concrete walls or whether there's just, you know, uh, grass and land, um, that I'm connected no matter where I am, right? Everything is, is from, from the earth. And, and I just have to remember, I just have to remember um, that I'm still part of the earth no matter what the earth looks like in that place. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So I really like to reactivate and um, and uh, add my remember into that. Um, mm. And then I think we got a good bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of um, in Here, Here by, or There, There, there. by Tommy, Tommy Orange. Um, We're going to call it he... Here, Here from now on. <laughs> here, Here. Oh, God. I hope, he here, here. I hope he's not watching. Wow. Um, <laughs> but... You know, he talks about like the city being the land, you know, yeah. which sounds so obvious. But I think being in a big city, sometimes I, I need to remember that, that everything, every it's all the earth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that also reminds me of something that I recently heard someone say. Um, I was in a workshop about Haudenosaunee and uh, Anishinaabe. Uh, food systems and food traditions. Um, and someone who um, was a fellow Haudenosaunee um, said like that from, from her perspective, uh, our ancestors always made do with what they had. So like now sh her view is that the most like Haudenosaunee thing we can do is like, is to, to you know, to accept what we have where we are. So whether we are on our, you know, ancestral lands or we're separate to, to, to make our home there and, and feel connected. So anyway, what you said, Shannon, just yeah. lit those lights in me. But. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so what, um, uh, we, we all kind of have our own, own path that gets us where we are today. Um, those paths are usually not this nice, neat. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I'm trying to think, do I know any Indians <laughs> have this nice, smooth path that they've just, you know, went to school and graduated, then went to the next school and graduated, then got a job and then, you know, have been there. Do, do we know people like that? Does anyone know people like that? Um, uh, anybody <laughs> like that. Um, uh, so our paths, all that, just to say our paths, you know, are a little rocky, uh, and have some struggles in them. Uh, I know for me, it took me 11 years to get an undergraduate degree and work myself through it. And, uh, um, and, you know, law school was not a fun proposition. And, and sometimes I still have nightmares about lawyers and, 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 uh, what the law can do to harm us. Um, uh, uh these trusted advisors that we so-call hire, uh, for tribes, uh, sometimes they create, uh, adversarialness and conflict instead of bringing people together. Uh, had a little experience with that today. Um, but, um, you know, what, what has y'all's path been like and, and, and where did you want to take it? Like, where do you, where do you want to go? Uh, how do you want to, both of you are in service to Indian country in different ways. Like where, where do you want to go? Is that a good question? <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah. yeah. It's a loaded question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, before I circle back and talk a little bit about my path, I just wanted to say, I think once you're working in Indian country, it's almost impossible to leave. It's like, 
<laughs> when once you're working uh and, and for the people and it seems like oh no matter where your path goes it's like it leads you right back to to indian country so have you i don't know have you tried <laughs> right i mean there or even thought about leaving like i've thought about like oh my god life would be so easier if i didn't have to put up with my relatives all day <laughs> I mean, like you're, you're constantly, even if it's not your family, there's still this element of, of, of relationship that's different than if you just go, you know, work and put in your eight hours and then go home. It's, it's, it's different. Um, I, I've thought about what am I? Oh man, this is, you know, I'm getting beat up so bad. You know, my relatives beat me up more than anybody else. Um, but anybody, ha have you have you all thought about leaving ever or wanting to be anonymous? I, I if I can jump in, um, I actually think I'm I'm kind of bending back towards or not back. I have never, you know, growing up away from. From community, I didn't um, think I was, you know, gonna uh, work in an indigenous community, um, and I think I'm in a in a moment of my life where I'm actually pivoting towards that more. Mm -hmm. The further I go, um, in undergrad, I thought I was gonna be an environmental scientist, and then I uh, realized that I really missed art um because i had always been an artist um so then i started pursuing art and then now i find myself in chicago working with a lot of native artists being in community with native artists and that is kind of like pulling me actually more into community not necessarily indian country although i do think all the time like hey i'll just move to oneida and get a job but um it's hard when you have roots in three different <laughs> cities, you know, I have roots in Albuquerque, I have roots here and I have roots in, in Wisconsin. So, so yeah, I actually think I'm kind of being, um, I'm gravitating kind of towards community right now, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I don't know how you feel Colleen about that question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think, it, uh, you know, to be honest, I think, yeah, I've, I've definitely thought about um, leaving this kind of work many times. I think we all have those impossible days that um, you're getting beat up in the arena by people who aren't even in the arena fighting with you. And um, it feels really lonely sometimes. And, um, you know, I've thought about it. I have, I have friends who, you know, were, were uh, making more money and doing better than me many times. And I thought, geez, I might be in the wrong field, but <laughs> you know, the, to be honest, I think it's what fuels my heart is working um, for Indian country. And um, you know, I think it always circle back to this work because for me, it was always about the people, never about myself. And, um, and even when I tried to leave, it kind of pulled me back. So I don't know that I have a choice. I think the ancestors are, are behind me kicking my butt back, back where I'm supposed to be. So um but, uh, but honestly, I think do whatever fills your heart. <laughs> do do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So how did so so what's your what's your y'all's rocky paths to um, where you are today? Well, yeah, like I said, you know, I I entered undergrad thinking, oh, I, you know, that I want. I was like. Very, at that moment, I felt very compelled um, by um, what is happening to our planet, you know, um, and that is de was definitely instilled in me by uh, my whole family, my Native and non-Native family. And so I went into environmental science, and then I just, something was missing. I, I was, like, good at it, but I was just like, this is, doesn't feel like what I'm being called to do. And then I, for a while, I was trying to double major in art and science, and uh, the University of New Mexico just made that pretty much impossible to double major in, in those. Um, 
so I had to pick and I, I just went with what felt right, which was art. And cause that's who I was making connections with. And, um, that's what was pulling me. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to be an artist. This is just what I'm going to do. Um, and then now like eight years later, I, I am an artist, I, <laughs> I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to move to Chicago at some point. So I applied to grad schools here in Chicago, ended up uh, getting into one. Um, and I think that was a very sharp bend in my path because uh, I, I was the only native person in my whole program. Um, and when I asked like, does anyone know any other like native people at the school? People would be like, oh, well, Frank Wallen went here, but he just graduated, so he's not here anymore. Like, okay, <laughs> that's not helpful. Um, so that was uh, interesting three years. I grew a lot and I made a lot of good connections with folks, but it was a, an intense period of like figuring out like where I didn't want to go. That makes sense. Like did not, I knew I didn't want to play the, the uh, fine art game and, and try to sell my art to rich people, which, you know, works for a lot of artists. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I just knew, you know, that wasn't my past. So <laughs> I think since grad school, I have really found it important to like, just be in community and working with people, whether it's, um, whether it's like easy, easy to explain as like, oh, this is an art project or whether it's a little bit more fluid. Um, that's kind of where I've been pulled right now is um, collaborating with with community and making art for for us, you know. Um, that's not always easy. And it's certainly not like a um, prepackaged career that you could just unbox and have a great salary and you know s smooth sailing um but it yeah it's where i've been pulled right now so yeah yeah and i'm grateful um though because chicago does have a beautiful indigenous community um of course like indigenous people have always been here and then there's also so many people from all over yeah, the world here yeah, relocated yeah. in the fifties, and so native yeah. families um, there for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, Colleen in the UP. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, before I start, I just wanted to say, River, I really I was thinking about how awesome it, um, your relatives must feel about how um, you said your your grandma was an artist too, and now. Now you're an artist. It seems like um, they must be really proud of your family. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. My cousin Hoka is an artist too. So we're definitely a, an artist family. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah so I grew up in the, the UP of Michigan um, where the air hurts your face um, like seven months out of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I have a sister, um, and um, I was fortunate to grow up with my mom and dad and um, pretty um, normal childhood. Although, um, when I went off to college, I was like, um, I was committed to my undergrad. I was in and out in four years. I signed my major and my minor the first month I was there. Like I was there for it. I was very committed. I wanted to get that done um, in a lot of ways to prove it to myself, but to prove it to a lot of people who I felt like doubted me along the way, especially as a kind of a young punk teenager who, who didn't, it didn't seem like I had a, a future ahead of me at that time. So I was really committed to like uh, proving you were, everybody. You were a young punk? I want to hear that story. <laughs> I was waiting for my mom to chime in and on the comments and say, yeah, she was, <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, fiercely independent and, um, and uh, loud and, and uh, really committed to the things I cared about. And so I think that 
Well, I think that that's probably something my entire life that I've either struggled with or has been either a, a, a good thing or sometimes a bad thing. So, um, yep, I was a young punk and uh, went to went off to school and did my undergrad in just uh, four years. And um, and uh, my mom says, "Oh, the stories." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us, Mary. <laughs> and, uh, you know I did normal things that I think a lot of us do you know just um being a punk and just you know dabbling in drugs and alcohol and just doing crazy things in college and um and when I came back um home and I started working for my tribe I was still a young punk and um I had a I had a teacher um uh, someone who I I just have so much respect for um, who taught me a lot of what I know, and his name is uh, Mr. Cecil E. Pavlot Sr. And um, basically, I think one day he just kind of sat me down and he said, like, you know, you're either going to be a punk and that's fine. You can keep doing those things um, or you can choose this path and and do these things. Um, but you have to choose and um, let me know. <laughs> Um, and I always appreciated that um, because I, I wasn't doing the right things. <laughs> and so um, he gave me a day to think about it. And I showed back up the next day and I said, you know what? I, wanna, I, want, I want this path. And I've kind of been on this path ever since. But I, you know, if I, don't, I don't know where I would have been if he hadn't kind of kicked me in the butt and sat me down and had that conversation, you know, because I think it's so easy for some of us to go, go a different path because, you know, a lot of a lot of our communities are are in a bad way, and there's lots of people taking those paths, and it seems easy sometimes. Um, so, yeah. And then I've been working. Um, I did a lot of years in repatriation and historic preservation, um, and uh, then, like I said, I was working um, with moms and babies with a perinatal opioid grant that I was working on, and then I went back to the tribe as the director of language and culture and. Um, so I've I've done a lot of uh, a lot of different things, uh, all the way from the doing maintenance <laughs> and uh, everything in between. So I've I've done a lot, but I think um, I'll, like again, always circling back to you know that um, that I knew that this path was for me, but I I really didn't. It was definitely not a linear straight path for me definitely struggled along the way and um, had a lot of traumas and just, you know, like I said, drugs and alcohol, different things going on. And so I'm, I'm happy to sit here today um, in, in this way and be confident and, and um, thankful that spirit guided me to this path. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. Shannon uh, Martin has a question for all of you. Um, I'm saying you too. What was the defining moment in your life when you heard your blood memory? It's a very good question. That's a great question. Wow. For me, there were a lot of different, uh, yeah. different points. Um, you know, every time my grandmother sat me down, and and told me stories about the really difficult things that she had to go through just to be alive um you know digging um you know um running away from abusers um, and so many other things that that i don't want to share um and, and then she would always end it. And, um, and um, I went through all that so you could be here, you know? So every time I had one of those talks, um, that, that blood memory would, would hit me. I, I had to do something with it. And all I know, knew is what she told me was to just go to school. That's, I didn't know what I was supposed to do except help our people what that meant i don't know what that meant um i just know that um how i took it to mean was so that other people didn't have to live in the same in the same way she had to um 
you know, even though, um, you know, she would have been 80 something now, um, you know, many of the things that she struggled with, people still struggle with today. Uh, you know, so um, I'm supposed to help that somehow. So that blood memory thing, I don't think ever goes away. You get those pangs ah, to remind you uh, why, why you're here, but that's where mine came from. Thank you okay, for sharing you that. Next. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I can go next. I, um, I think like you said, Shannon, there's been a lot of, for me, there's been a lot of little moments. Um, I think my, uh, one of the big things is my connection to art yeah. <clears throat> because my grandma, uh, she wasn't an artist her whole life. She, or she didn't know she was an artist her whole life. Um, she did a lot of different jobs, you know, and back in the forties, like, you know, there, there were only so many jobs that, that uh, would hire a native woman. So she did a lot of like secretary work. She was in the, the army um, as a assistant for a general. Um, but she has a story um, and she's still with us. She's 102 now. Um, she's on the Oneida Res. Um, but she shares a story um, of going to a museum and seeing an Oneida pot. Um, and she told me that she wanted to just like reach into the glass and pick it up and feel it and like connect to it. And then she knew she was an artist and that she uh, dedicated her life to studying our pottery, which had been uh, in decline for a long time. Um, but that story always like struck me um, and also other stories of what it means to be an artist in, in our, in many of our communities, you know, it's more than a job, it's storytelling and healing. And, you know, our languages wouldn't have necessarily had a word like artist, um, because there are so many other things that an artist uh, might do for a community. And I think that coming to that like understanding of like, you know, in, in our culture, like there is a place for artists and like an important and honored place for storytellers. Um, I think that really was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm an artist, I'll answer that call. You know, cause there were a lot of moments in college where I was like, should I just do something that is gonna like pay my bills and, you know, let me come home at five o'clock every day? Like maybe, but that, you know, I think there was a moment at some point where I was like, oh, like this is, <laughs> you know, this is like, this is calling me. Um, so I think that was kind of a big, big, uh, thing for me and it was just in all these little moments of like you know talking and being with my grandma and also just learning more about our history um and for me i'm not a potter but um in grad school i uh used a printing press for the first time and that was kind of my like shock moment of like i touched it and was like, oh, I need to make art on this. Um, and I, and I still love printmaking. It's, it's like a full body dance almost. You have to move with the machine and you're, it's very choreographed. Um, and you know, our, like a thousand years ago, we maybe didn't have printing presses on Turtle Island. Um, but I think like that connection to the body and, and to movement, um, is, has been really, like, I just, I just love that. Um, so anyway, that's my answer to that question, but. That was beautiful, River. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think like uh, both uh, Shannon and River mentioned, I think there's lots of, lots of times where I knew that, um, 
I only made it out alive because of my blood memory, <laughs> of whatever the situation was. But I can think of one that I think not only was one uh, one big moment for me, um, but it was also um, like spiritually one of the biggest moments uh, and defining moments for me. Uh, it was actually, um, and um, I want to talk about this in the most respectful way possible because it has to do with um, the ancestors. So um, I just want to say, acknowledge our Gete and Anishinaabek, the ancestors, for all that they do. Um, and thank you for this beautiful lesson that I was given. Um, and I was with my teacher, Mr. Cecil E. Pavlot Sr., and we were on our way to do our first three burial ceremony. I, um, and I had never done it before. I just want to say that. And so we're in the vehicle on the way there. And I say, I look over at him and I say, I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. And then he would look back at me and he'd say, you'll know. Then I'd sit there and I'd say, I don't know. I'm nervous. What do I do? And he'd just say, you'll know. And so the anxiety is, is, is rising. And I'm like, I don't know. You have to tell me. I don't know what to do. And he'd say, you'll know. And he would say that the entire way there. So then when we get there, I'm like, no, this time I'm serious. I really don't know what I'm doing and I'm scared. And he was like, you'll know. <laughs> and so he's like, I'll be over here getting ready for a ceremony and you be over there doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I was terrified. I was scared. I had never done that before, but um, out of nowhere, I just something, I just, I started speaking the language to, to the ancestor that was there. And um, at that time, I was still really a beginner in the language and I didn't know much, but I was fitting out every word I could think of and um, really trying to to do my best for that ancestor. And um, turns out I I knew what to do. So he was right. I did know, but I was I was scared. I was shaking in my boots, uh, really, really scared. And so that was that was uh, probably one of my big moments of, OK, you know, I'm right where I need to be because it's like the ancestors will communicate with you. You just have to listen and pay attention and, and see how how they're going to communicate with you. So that was one of my big ones. Well, that's a that's a deep one. And and. Uh, oh, um, and, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about <laughs> about repatriation and how to be supportive of, of other tribal practitioners and making space for tribal practitioners who are, who are new, uh, who are young, um, and, and those that, you know, don't have yet a ceremony or something to help the process. Um, so I'm so glad that, not to get off topic, um, but so glad we have you at the association to kind of um, help us with that and make sure we uh, support tribes in the in the right way with that work. Um, yeah. But there's a, a couple of folks on in chat that, that have been asking you all some questions here. Um, and JD has one for, for you, River, um, that makes me I think saw. about, yeah, that makes me think about not just the direction of Native art, but also, um, uh, also your experience in how you express yourself in native art, which is not necessarily what, what other people think is, is indigenous mm. native art. And we were talking about this before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the art, there's kind of the art world, right? Like the New York, LA kind of dominated like art world. And then there's like all the native artists and there's, some over, you know, there's some overlap there, of course. And then there's some, you know, non overlap. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of different views on this. I think going back to what I was saying about like the Haudenosaunee way is that we, we, uh, we give thanks for what we're given. Um, you know, I, I was given a love of printmaking, so I feel like that's my, like, I need to follow that. Um, printmaking and writing. <clears throat> so, like, I have never really worried too much about, like, that dichotomy between, like, traditional and um, 
contemporary art because it has always felt like if if I'm a native person, you know, whatever I'm making is native art and um, not to simplify it too much, but yeah. And I think I, of course I've had like the question of like, well, should I be like maybe studying pottery like my grandma or should I be, you know, learning um, an older like art form? Um, but when I was starting to study printmaking, I started asking my teachers because <coughs> I was very good at this. I'm in school um, almost my whole life of asking where were the natives? So I got, you know, I was in a printmaking class and I was like, we've talked a lot about uh, white printmakers. Um, where, what about like, surely there are, have been native printmakers since printing presses came to our lands. Um, and my teacher said, I don't know, <laughs> um, but you could probably find out. So I had to kind of do that digging on my own. And I actually found, learned, came to learn about, um, um, and of course now his name is, his English name escapes me, um, but his, his name, his first name in English was John. Um, and he was a printer in, uh, I, you know, what we would call Massachusetts now, um, at one of the first printing presses in the British colonies. And reading about his life was really eye-opening for me um, because some historians wrote him off as just, oh, you know, he he was native, but he was just printing, you know, stuff for the British, so whatever. Um, but when you really look at his, his life, um, he was putting his own native perspective on what he was doing. Um, and he was helping translate things into uh, his um, his language. And of course, you know, the politics of that at that time were probably complex. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, he was, he was standing in his own truth in that field, in what, have, you know, I imagine could not have been an easy thing to be the first native printmaker. Um, but anyway, he ended up um, the last thing that he's known to have printed is a flyer that was basically um, saying F off to the British during King Philip's war. So in the end, he did like use his art um, and his like knowledge um, in, in to say, you know, like you can't erase me just because I, you know, you taught me your um art form so anyway i don't know i feel like i'm rambling a little bit but that was learning about his life and thinking about um you know what it means to bring your own um history and identity and experiences to to art um has kind of guided me so yeah i don't i don't worry too much about that distinction between like traditional and contemporary art i think you know, our arts are evolving all the time. Right. And it's important to look back at where they've been, but to also know that we're not stuck there. Right. And, so. and the idea to think that we are somehow only a culture and only a people if it's static. Yeah. And our culture exactly. is static and how we do things are static. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say that for people to think that that we don't want our items back that have been stolen from the past. Those are important for us to continue forward, right? Yeah. Um, but our, our cultures and our people don't remain static. Our languages don't remain static. There's a, um, a comment or a question to you, Colleen, from JD. Can you comment on the loss of language keepers and elders, since since you're working with language, you've been talking about language and, and, and what that's been like. And, and can I share something with you real quick, Colleen, before you get into that? Sure. I, I had this conversation with this old academic 
um, who had been studying languages and was extremely smart. And, <laughs> and he was just grilling me about the loss of native languages. How can there even be natives without a language and look at the losses? No one's bringing these languages back. I mean, really, there's this idea in academia and other places that our, our languages are just like dying away every day. And I don't know that that's true or not, because what I see is I see tribes that have been able to rebuild their language, reinstitute um, language programs. Um, I'm sure, I mean, that's not how all Indian country is, but do you have some insight with, with the work that you've done in, in language and culture for, for your tribe? Um, what, what that looks like and respond to JD's question. Yeah, um, thanks, JD, for that good question, and thanks, Shannon. Yeah, um, I think I think most of our communities are in similar situations. I think we've definitely seen a, a massive loss of language, and I used to kind of buy into that. Um, we have to, um, you know, bring our language back, bring our language back, bring our language back, which to me sounds like it's gone. Uh, it's it's been gone. And so um, I kind of had to retrain my mind um, the last like probably like two years and, and say things like reactivate, remember, revitalize, because our language isn't lost while a lot of our language keepers have passed on and a lot of um, our dialects have changed because our instructors are changing and we have instructors coming from other locations to bring language to our communities where we don't have uh, people who have that knowledge, right? Things have changed and evolved, um, but our language is still alive. And I know that because I've, I've witnessed our children uh, say words in our language. I've, I've, I've been around, um, you know, children who are retaining language at uh, much better than I am. <laughs> Um, and even with myself, I remember, I always just say I'm a, a lifetime uh, Anishinaabe Moan language learner, but I remember um, when I only could could use two words. And and then I remember maybe when I could use, you know, a lot more. And, and now I can, I can communicate pretty well um, and understand uh, fluent speakers or, or um, try to hold um, a conversation with really small sentences. And so I, I can see the the, the evolving um, kind of journey of, of my language um, abilities. And so I know that it's possible. I know that our communities aren't producing language learners at the rate that we would like to see. But I also know that there's a lot of young people who are, who are taking the language up and being very serious about it. And so, um, you know, I, I know that that we always think of it as, it's lost or it's gone or, or, and yes, our language is in danger, but I, I believe that there's a lot of people who are picking it up and um, really running with it. And, and um, I, I've definitely um, saw in a lot of our communities across Michigan anyway, it's like language is really um, um, at the forefront, I think. And, and you can see that with language programs and instructors and and um but then the other part of that is like you know te with technology um change i think we're just seeing a little bit of a challenge because most of the instructors that i know are all elders and they're they're having a rough time trying to, uh, to learn our new ways of technology and so we gotta we gotta give them a little break and, and meet them halfway and and um help them help them to teach us in a good way um but also recognizing that they, they struggle too with this technology. So um, yeah, I, I think that we have to be concerned about language and we have to make it all of our mission to learn language. And um, I know I'm rambling, but I want to say one more thing. I, I remember a time when um, this, I was at cer a ceremony and this gentleman from Canada, and I apologize because I don't remember his name. Um, he stood up and he, he, He's the reason that I uh, wanted to learn the language and, and um, because he said, I don't feel bad. For, or he, he spoke only in the language for a long time. And then he asked the audience to raise their hand if they understood. And that one person 
could raise their hand and then he said, I don't feel bad for you. It's your responsibility to learn the language. Seek out the language, uh, seek it out, go to your elders, ask for it, find it. Um, it's our responsibility. And he really like lit this fire in my heart and I thought, no one is gonna learn the language for me. Nobody is going to um, all of a sudden bring me uh, this whole uh, you know, language ability and put it inside me without me doing the work. So. Um, I think there's a lot of language resources out there all across Canada and uh, here in, in the U.S. And I think we just have to start focusing on that and giving it a little bit of attention. And I think we, our communities can, um, there's already, I think, already been um, a growth in language, but I think we'll see a lot more if, if we all take a personal responsibility to learn the language too. And, and um, what else? Oh, yeah. there. I want to answer that question too. Uh, I think at least for the Sioux Tribe, we document our language, or we document our language lessons, and so we have like a Facebook page that we maintain and a live stream page, and so the language lessons are recorded and I think archived, and so there is a lot of um, making sure that we're keeping um, that documentation so generations to come have access to it. Next. Okay, that's all. Me French. <laughs> And, and Colleen and River, do you hear Colleen's uh, vocals kind of go in and out, or is that just me? It's going a little in and out. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah. Colleen, if, if you're not aware, we're kind of losing some of your, we can still hear you. Okay. Um, but it's, I'm not sure if something's going on on your end, you you can fix. Hello, Denver Sky. Denver Sky's trying to get our attention from, from Twitter out there. Welcome. Glad you're with us. Um, uh, let's see. I have some questions. Um, I want to get into some like issues, uh, like issues in Indian country, whether it's missing and murdered, whether it's, uh, you know, jurisdiction or sacred sites or whatever it is. And talk about, you know, what your, your, have you ever been, personally involved in any of those, how has Indian country issues actually affected you? Like, 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 I guess what I'm trying to ask, like, like, for example, um, uh, identity issues uh, about uh, tribal, uh, you know, people being disenrolled, uh, about are you Indian enough? What does it mean to be native? has always been a question that I've asked myself because my grandmother was a uh, full blood Choctaw um, and I, and she raised me, but I would get something else from people around me, um, especially going outside Oklahoma when people didn't look like me anymore. Um, uh, you know, are you're, you're not native. He was um, one of and it can that you, Colleen? I'm sorry, I was hearing <laughs> I was hearing some weird sounds coming out of the um, uh, the tech here. Um, you know, I guess so. I'm asking, you know, what are some of the issues in Indian country that that you're kind of on our long list of issues that that we have to face either at the association or just um, out there generally that have been personal to you. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I got to think about that one for a second. I think we'll play That's some. A big like, question. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> I don't have a drum. You know, we need Roy here to to sing for us. <laughs> um. Well, maybe I can I can jump in and not to not to speak before River at all. Um, no, you can go. Uh, well, I know, um, so my dad actually uh, was part of the boarding school era. So him and his uh, siblings spent quite a few years at Harbor Springs uh, boarding school. And so growing up um, in our house, well, I feel like there was tons of love and, and I felt loved all the time. There was also some some things, right? Some things that I don't know that my dad was ever able to heal from. And I think um, definitely, um, could see intergenerational trauma play out with my sister and I. And um, so I, I remember um, not understanding as a child 
why um, my dad didn't like certain holidays or he didn't like to do certain things. Um, or he he seemed like he was angry, right? He And um, I never quite understood that um, until I was uh, well, about into my early 20s. So I never could um, understand, I guess, like, um, you know, why he acted that way. But um, I also knew that that kind of thing needed to, to end uh, um, with me and my sister. So I think that, um, I was really able to have that conversation with my dad and, and talk to him a little bit about his experience and let him know that I understood why, um, certain things were, were the way they were. And, um, after he, my dad passed away about three years ago, and after he had passed, um, I actually learned more about his boarding school experience from from his siblings um, after the fact, um, after he'd already passed. I learned a lot more about it. And and now even today, so many things make a lot more sense um, about why he was the way he was and, and some of the things that have played out in my life um, and the things I see playing out in my sister's life. And um, unfortunately, even down to my niece, my sister's daughter, and how that intergenerational trauma that we hear about all the time, right? We're hearing about it in Indian country. We're, we're talking about it. We're having these conversations, but I know that firsthand. I see it in my own family. And so um, I think that's one that's really, you know, it hits home for me and it's really personal just because I can definitely see it, you know, playing out firsthand with us. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, that goes back to, what Sophia on Facebook said a, a few minutes ago about us being, you know, the seventh generation um, after, uh, you know, a lot of that ancestral trauma. Um, and this is actually Colleen, that that's the same issue that I would say is the biggest one in my life is boarding schools. Um, you know, I didn't know about the boarding schools and what that meant for a long time and um, it was kind of uh, not talked about a lot in my family. Mm -hmm. It was known, but it was, I, I don't know if it was like fear or not knowing how to talk about it, um, but it it's only been the last couple of years that I've really learned more about, you know, what happened at the boarding schools, what they were doing to us and, uh, what that meant for for my great grandparents are the ones who um, were in boarding school. They were taken to Carlisle, mm -hmm. um, and I and I see that you know because I don't I wasn't raised uh, speaking Oneida or practicing our ceremonies, and I'm you know now that I'm. I'm an adult, you know, I'm reconnecting in, with those things in different ways. Um, but it was, I mean, like like you were saying, Colleen, like understanding what the boarding schools meant helped me understand a lot of, of why, uh, you know, my grandma doesn't speak the language and why my dad and I don't speak the language. Um, and... And also, you know, after my great grandparents uh, came back from Carlisle and started a family, <laughs> they sent my grandma to not a not an Indian school, but a boarding school, and then come to my dad's generation. And he and his sister, uh, my aunt, um, were also sent to boarding school. And me and my aunt have talked about this. Like, it just was what my family knew of, like you know, of, okay, you know, if, if things aren't working out in uh, school or you're having trouble, like just go to boarding school and that'll fix everything. Um, and it was my, my dad's generation who was like, no, we can be done with that now, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that that is, yeah. So calling that speaks to me too, a lot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah right. just been, thinking about that a lot lately yeah i don't i don't know of too many 
Native families who haven't been um, uh, damaged somehow by boarding schools. Uh, and of course, we know that there's the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. We've, we've had a couple of folks from there on our Red Hoop Talk show to talk about boarding schools. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my, it's the same way. My, my grandmother would walk into a room and all the adults would stop speaking Choctaw because um, uh, they did not want um, their children to struggle uh, with being burdened somehow by their culture, by being different um, mm -hmm. uh, because of their boarding school experiences. So uh, that's, um, there's legislation that, uh, and, and River, maybe you're, uh, uh, closer to this than, than I am, uh, there was some legislation put forward, I think Deb Holland and um, Elizabeth Warren, I think, co-sponsored it, and it was about um, truth and, and reconciliation and, and boarding school healing. Uh, I think uh, Shannon Martin may know a little bit about that, too, and, and uh, uh, Shannon Martin was on our show uh, with Tiger, um, her wife, uh, talking about what they're doing at Saginaw Chippewa with the, with the boarding school that was there. Um, uh, this is such a big issue, um, uh, and I'm glad you all raised it. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, at the same way, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for healing, but it's hard to get there because you have layer upon layer of, of, of hell to have to work through. Um, and, and you, you just look at how our families have been, you know, it, unless you really take a look at your family and your family dynamics, sometimes you don't realize how that, that historic and intergenerational trauma affects you today and how it's tied into that, um, you know, the boarding schools. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really complex issue and, and it, it makes me almost overwhelmingly feel depressed and heavy talking about it. Yeah. I, I, um, I appreciate what you said, just said though, Shannon, about it being an opportunity for healing, even when it is hard, because the more, and I would say the more that I learn about the boarding schools and, and what happened at Carlisle and what happened to my family, the more it's like, oh, this is why this thing in my life is hard for me, you know, or this is why this was hard for for my for other people in my family. So that in itself is just so healing. Um, wow. Just, yeah. just think of all the opportunities that we have that that generations before us just didn't have like our grandparents generation didn't have the opportunity to just go on google and google the national native american boarding school healing coalition or the association on american indian affairs or anything else yeah and learn about these issues and go oh hell or get on a language program from wherever they are i mean uh or freaking listen to a youtube show with a <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have so many more opportunities to heal today than those that came before us. Yeah, I really think that um, I I try to uh, operate in that way, just reminding myself that you know we we are the the prayers, right? We we're the product of so many prayers before us, and so many hardships, and so many. Um, Sometimes even some of our ancestors paid with their lives. So I always try to operate in that way and remind myself to, to be a good ancestor so that um, those coming after us, um, maybe they don't have to do as much of the hard stuff or maybe they, they'll have more language. Uh, maybe they'll have access to things that we didn't or um, won't have to learn as many of the hard lessons. So I always try to operate in, in that way, just thinking back and what my dad went through and what um, those before him went through and just try to 
to think of how I might be able to keep that in mind as I do my work. It makes me feel a lot better about what they went through if I if I try to do something that I think would honor that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, not to change the subject, I guess I'm not changing the subject, to build on the subject. I, um, I think about that too when it comes to being uh, someone who is queer and native um, because like growing up, I didn't have other native folks who were LGBTQ or two-spirit. Um, and now I'm very thankful that in my life I do have two-spirit folks and queer folks and trans folks. Um, and I've been able to learn about, you know, people who came before us. And with being queer, it's almost like another form of lineage of like, that isn't, um, like biological right it's like spiritual spiritual lineage and so i feel very grateful that i've been able to to learn about like what our queer and trans native ancestors went through before us um and also uh and that really drives me similar to what you're saying colleen mm -hmm. um i want to be a good ancestor to young queer and trans native folks um Cause you know, I was lucky, like, you know, my, I have a very loving supportive family, but I didn't have a lot of like context growing up. Like I was like, I don't know any native queer people. So I guess you can't be both, you know, guess I just have to pick one. Um, and I don't want, I, I hope that my work as an artist uh, can like tell those stories and yeah, be a good ancestor to, to the next generation for sure. I just, you, yes, thank you. You just reminded me, um, one of my mentors, his name was Lester Brown, uh, and he taught at Cal State Long Beach. He was uh, Cherokee and wrote a, a, a book on two-spirit people and um, was himself. And one of the things that he left me, that he gave me, was a pair of earrings. And I just realized listening to you, River, that those were his earrings that he gave me. It just now connected that what he gave me was, was his earrings. And I don't know why that never hit me. I mean, that to me, that, that, that's an important part of who he was that he often didn't get to express, mm. right? It was something that he could wear only sometimes. Um, and, um, and I still have those. Um, wow, that was, a, that was a weird little thing that came to my brain. I don't know if that... If that um, He's saying hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and we should we should probably do like a jewelry competition here. Let's see what we what we got and what what do you got going on over there, uh, Colleen? I see your I see here. I'm not seeing what's at the end. Okay, it's a whole it's a rope. Beautiful. You've got, you've got yellow, <laughs> yellow. Oh uh, yeah. Those, is that beautiful? Oh, I see it. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. These are my new favorites. Uh, River's got some. Uh, she's a Christmas power. present. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the longer, the longer the earrings are, the the wiser, stronger woman you are. So I'm I'm hoping to channel that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm channeling here. <laughs> I'm trying Super to be Superwoman, yeah. I love that. Me yeah. too. The first time I saw um I think I was at Gathering of Nations in Albuquerque, and the first time I saw um, a young person uh, dance in like Superman themed regalia. I that would just like gave me so much joy, that memory, because um, they obviously felt really powerful in it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. I wish I had a picture of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've appreciated superheroes more 
as an older person than I ever did when I was young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so many amazing uh, native comics now, oh, yeah. superhero comics coming out. Oh yeah. Um, and there's a whole, there's Red Planet Comics in Albuquerque that just sells native comics now. Wow. And they host, yeah, and they host uh, native Comic-Con, I think. I mean, not, not in 2020, they didn't, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. they did in 2019, yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway. Yeah, well, we've got to move this. We got to, we got to talk about something funny here. <laughs> can't it can't be too much of a day owner <laughs> so, so um uh uh tomorrow's martin luther king day uh martin luther king jr um uh and i'm not sure uh what's going on in 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 your city river and how close you are to um the downtown area colleen we don't have to worry about you you're off in the in the UP. Uh, <laughs> right. But are you, are you close to anything? Is there any concern or, or safety concern where you are for the inauguration or other things that are happening? Oh, we'll see in Chicago. I mean, our capital is Springfield. I don't know if there's going to be protests in Springfield. I don't know if there's going to be stuff here, but I feel pretty safe. I, I have a strong support system that we navigated, you know, the very different protests this summer and some of the the pushback that those got from the, the city government. So not sure what's going to happen this week in Chicago, but... I feel pretty safe. Yeah. 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 I, 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 a, a lot of stuff is coming out out here about the uh, Capitol police and how they actually were allowing uh, the rioters in uh, and taking selfies with them, um, letting them come in with guns um, and they're being investigated. Uh, but there's all sorts of, uh, you should have saw a map of the Washington DC area with all the roads closed. So there's, it's almost impossible to, to get anywhere. I think in mm. DC this, this week, um, coming on inauguration and, um, uh, it, we're, we're living in a really, uh, unique time and, uh, we'll hopefully soon have a cabinet member who's native uh, so what does, uh, what do you think that will do? What do you think that effect that'll have on, on the work we want to do to support Indian country? Colleen, do you have thoughts? <laughs> Other, I can jump in, but I just want to make sure I'm not talking over you. No, go ahead. Okay. I'm still thinking um, over here. Yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful, right, about Deb Holland taking that position because <clears throat> that's so, you know, that is a position that has such influence on U.S. policy towards our tribal nations. So I'm hopeful. I um, worry, though, you know, that she's just one person. We can't expect her to fix, you know, all of our problems, of course. And um, there have also been concerns that um, um, and I, I am not an expert on this issue but I've seen people raise concerns with Deb Holland um, not responding at all to what's going on in the with Choctaw and Chickasaw Freedmen um, right now who are saying they're you know um, getting different treatment because of their color, the color of their skin um, from their nations. And I've seen activists call on her to say something about it. And she hasn't or not yet, you know? So like, I've just been kind of seeing like, I hope, you know, she can, she can really do good in that role. I'm hopeful, you know, and I don't, I don't know her or much about her other than 
um, her work in yeah, Congress, and, but and and, and yeah. the federal the federal response to issues like that has a, and may always be well that is a sovereignty issue that's an internal that's an inherent power of tribal governments to declare who's a member and who's not, or who's a citizen yeah. and who's not. Yeah. And so we don't want to interfere in that, in that inherent sovereignty that tribes have. But the thing is, is that these were treaties and agreements that, um, uh, that blacks um, who were a part of those nations um, they were part of. There were agreement just as much as any treaty was an agreement. Yeah. So that's a good example. Um, but, um, you know, so, uh, and the U.S. was, from what I understand, a, a, a part of those agreements um, and kind of masterminded those. So it seems to me that the U.S. has to take some kind of position that is anti-discriminatory, right? that protects human rights. Um, yeah. And, and I think, I think that's the right thing to do. I don't think it's a popular thing to do for some nations or for some people in some nations. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I just wanted to say that, um, when I first, uh, uh, heard about uh, Deb Holland being nominated for the Secretary of Interior. I was excited. I was ecstatic. Right? I kept thinking, um, "Wow! Like, what does that show our our young people that that they can can sit at the table and they can be in these positions?" Um, but after a lot of like thinking, out was wondering, like, to myself, would um, would she be in a position to be more effective, you know, in Congress rather than um, in, in the interior. Um, however, uh, since I do a whole lot of repatriation work in, in historic preservation, which is, um, uh, has a, the interior oversees historic preservation. So, um, I know that our, our natural resources and our lands are in danger and that there's a lot of, of good that can come out of it, I think. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful and, and excited to see, some of the good things that can come of that. And um, also still the first Native American and to be the first Native American and be a woman <laughs> um, as the, the uh, to be the, you know, Secretary of Interior, I think that's huge and that's monumental. And I think we have to celebrate that. And, and, um, and we should, and we should let our young people know that, um, you know, that the sky's the limit, they can have big dreams and, and sit at the table and do those things um, too. So that was my kind of take on absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Lance raises a good point. She still has to go through the, the confirmation hearing process. And so she's kind of, you know, doing her best not to cause any controversy uh, before she undertakes that process, which is right, the right thing that you have to do if you're political. Uh, this is why I don't think I would make a good politician because I could not <laughs> sit and wait my turn to stop, you know, I don't, I don't think I could do that to and, play nice for so yeah. long. And what's, what's so weird about living in DC and actually having moved, moved to the East coast, um, uh, people are so freaking paranoid and backbiters in this. I, I you know, I used to, I used to say, in fact, in law school, I used to tell everyone I was going to be president of the United States. That was my my job goal. Um, and kid around about it. Uh, had the dean calling me, you know, uh, you know, Mrs. President or something, um, uh, which helped feed my ego and maybe my confidence in law school. But but once I actually came out here to the east. And started working with people who were in the political process. Oh, it, it is such, um, uh, you know, they are so paranoid and um, are thinking like chess players. 
So they're thinking of all these different moves at different, if, if you come out like this, all the things that will happen over here, or all the things that will happen over here that will either support or just, you know, crush you um, and your whole life and every single decision you make, even what restaurant to go to is often, um, uh, you know, is there is a puppeteer out there doing all this that you have to be mindful of. And, and, um, it was, it was, uh, a, a little bit too insane for me to, uh, want to participate any further. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I do not like the political rat race around here. Um, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy when I get an opportunity to maybe take the association on the road. Where should I go? <laughs> I need to take uh, Lance up. said that uh, someone from Akuma is maybe running to replace Deb. Oh, I would love to know more about that. But. Yeah, let's see if America is ready and can keep up. Oh yeah, well, yeah. it's too late. We're gonna we're gonna keep going. So tell me about um, how it's difficult to work in Indian country. I think we touched on it a little bit, but are there things that um, you wish were different? or um, that are hard? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and you know, I think, I almost feel like it's um, something that has been hard for me working in Indian country, but I think it's just hard for me wherever I go. And I think that has a lot to do with um, feeling like um i'm uh i'm always just uh how do i always say this um i'm i don't necessarily look native <laughs> so let's just get that out uh i think that's really hard because i think there's a lot of lateral violence that like exists in our communities and i think sometimes that's really hard to work when you're just committed to like the the work and committed to to working um for indian country and and you're committed to just working for the people um but but sometimes it is a struggle when you feel like maybe maybe you have to prove yourself or something and i think that's something that i've experienced as as a light-skinned native for sure from my own community from outside my community and um and and you know what i let that bother me for a long time where i felt like almost i had to prove myself everywhere i went mm -hmm. um and and I felt a little bit like maybe I didn't fit in or or maybe I shouldn't go to that ceremony or I shouldn't show up to this place or maybe I shouldn't go and dance or maybe I shouldn't sing or whatever it was right um but but I but I grew a little bit and and I um started talking to some elders and I just um you know I I think that I've I've come a long way in, in that regard because I don't think that there's time anymore for me to be worried about what I look like and whether I fit in um, or whether there's a seat at the table for me um, because I, I don't care. <laughs> I'm committed to the work and, and I know where I come from and I learned a lot about where I came from and that made me feel so much better in my heart and my spirit to reconcile um, you know, my, my family ties and where we come from and to know like I come from a very sacred place. And um, I don't I don't necessarily care if, if I look native enough for, for anybody because I'm still going to be there fighting for Indian country. And um, and I think sometimes that's just something we have to say in our communities and start empowering our youth. There's a lot of our young people who are struggling with identity and, 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 and we're not having this larger conversation about about the 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 way that we all look different and we're all different shapes and sizes and colors and, and that doesn't make anybody less indigenous or less native um, but i know that um for a fact that it's really affecting our youth too so i would like to see you know a large larger conversations about this in indian country but you know i think there's a lot of reasons why working in indian country can be a little bit hard but i think for me that's one that i almost felt like in I had to I had to bring it up just to like get it out of the conversation, you know. And and now I I I don't feel like that. It's just I know who I am, I know where I come from and and I'm not going to I'm not going to be here trying to prove that to anyone anymore. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little riled up, but No. no. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for saying that. 
Um, I mean, like I was saying, I, I don't like necessarily, I've never worked uh, like in Indian country, but um, but I work in native community and <clears throat> I think I would echo what you're saying, Colleen, um, is like wishing that there was more of a conversation or that it was easier to have these conversations about, um, you know, all of our different backgrounds. Um, and I, I've, I got that same thing for so long, especially living, living in the Southwest where native people often are darker than me. Um, it was like, Oh, you're native. What? I've had people like ask me if I'm Mexican, if I'm, um, like Middle Eastern, like, so yeah, you know, like people just like, don't always know what to make of me. And I'm like, that's cause you have, don't know any native people <laughs> or you do like only, you know, um, have this one idea of what, what native people look like. Um, so I think that has been hard and, um, and, and I wish I, I want, us to have like a little bit more grace with each other when it comes to those things. Cause you know, um, uh, in Chicago, in the, in the native community, I've seen people just really hurt each other around misconceptions of like, you're not native enough or, um, your experiences don't look like mine. So that invalidates them. And mm -hmm. it's like, that's not getting us anywhere, you know, and sometimes, you know, it can be important to talk about like, okay, light skin privilege versus, you know, um, things that darker skin natives go through or, um, you know, how our tribal history affects kind of our station in life. But um, that doesn't mean that we can't have like grace with each other around our differences. And so, yeah. I think that has been hard for me too. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, grace is, just... a, grace is a beautiful word, River. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. glad you used that. That's, that's mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. I've been, I was talking about this earlier today with someone, so that's why I'm sighing because I'm just like, oh my gosh. Um, this is an ongoing conversation for sure. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and why we wanted to do Red Hoop Talk was an opportunity for people to see all sorts of natives from all over Indian country and to hear about all the things that we're interested in and, and talk about. And, and um, there's this great uh, law review article by uh, one of my professors, Robert Williams, that talks about uh, you know him being in academia and being the native, native scholar, lawyer, whatever, and people kind of expecting when they met him or interviewed him that, you know, what am I supposed to be here wearing a feather? What is it you're expecting from me and, and, and who do you think I am? And, and his whole career has been doing a hell of a lot of good research. Um, uh, don't hesitate to look up Robert A. Williams Jr. Um, Google him and read some of his books. Um, uh, uh, especially like a loaded weapon. Oh, savage as the wolf, uh, I think is, uh, that. And then there was a recent one, which was kind of like a Western Civ book. And I can't remember, um, the title of it, but he's got some good stuff, uh, you know, that really gets into, uh, the racism of the courts and, and, um, and, and even the judges, uh, so really interesting writing, and it's much more complex than that. But where was I going with this? Grace is is a beautiful word, and and you know it hit me when you were talking, River, that you said, well, I haven't worked in Indian country, but I've worked in community, and um, I just kind of want to remind you that yes, you work in Indian country. You reminded us that that Chicago was uh, the original homelands of the Potawatomi. True. And then I thought, yes. well, 
what if we all could, what if we all said that? We all work in Indian country, all of us. I don't care who you are. We all work in Indian country. I wonder how how different our, our, our uh, job descriptions and our jobs would be if we all mm. recognize that we are all in Indian country, uh, no matter where we are in the U.S. So I really took this in a different direction. Uh, but <laughs> No, that's a really good point, yeah. But I, I could... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, as I was saying that, I was like, you know, I I, I heard the you heard what you said. <laughs> I heard what I said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and knew that I would probably poke you on it. <laughs> no, I'm glad. Yeah. When All when right. you were when you said that river in my mind, I thought, what's the difference between Indian yeah. country and Native community? I was thinking those like. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like you're saying, Shannon, it's like it's all Indian country. I think my for a moment my mind was like thinking about legal definitions and you know capital yeah. I, capital C Indian country, but um but yeah, anyway. Yeah, let's not uh people don't seem to like lawyers around here, so we'll <laughs> leave the legal definitions out. <laughs> <laughs> so so how are y'all feeling about being on red hoop talk do you think did you like it what else should we talk about or, or are we done i know you both have had long days so colleen colleen is has, has been busy in her personal life river has been in meetings today i've been in meetings today um it's sunday but we've been acting like it's a it's a work day <laughs> yeah no, this has been a really good conversation. Um, yeah, I've and it's like at the beginning, Shannon, you were like, "We don't have to talk about work," uh, and I'm glad. I'm I am glad that we could have a open conversation and and be talking with folks um, we're watching because um, we don't have we don't get to have these conversations a lot when we're running around doing our stuff for work at the association. So I'm, I'm really grateful that we got to chat tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks River. I'm glad you could do it. Yeah. I remember watching uh, a couple, a couple episodes of, of red hoop talk. Um, and it was like, that's so cool. Like, <laughs> Um, I never imagined I would I would be on here. It's just so cool. I was like, oh man, you're not like you're not somebody till you're on Red Hoop Talk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but all in all seriousness, um, what amazing way to have these conversations and to bring people in from all over and to have just open, honest, and and good conversation and um and and talk about the things and you know it's really hard for me because i think um whatever i'm doing for work is a lot of what i do anyway personal life or just um so it's hard for me to to separate those things but it's been really um really nice tonight to just talk about whatever has come up and, and respond to some of the chat and um really um i love talking about issues that affect indian country i could be here all day <laughs> I have to share this. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that means. <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Liz? <laughs> it's traditional A. <laughs> oh. a. Yeah, that's what that means. That means A. Into the, into the. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Lance. Um, uh, oh, hell. So, um, well, y'all are probably off tomorrow, right? I'm not making you work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I am? <laughs> no, I'm saying, yeah, I oh. think we're off. Okay. <laughs> Last I checked. <laughs> I haven't sent you any emails. Uh, um, uh, let's see. So we're off. We're going to contemplate um, about and hopefully send some good thoughts about uh, what's happening in our world uh, and I'll invite everyone to join us in on that. And um, next week uh, we're going to have, um, I had actually 
last week's Red Hoop Talk show thought that Deborah Yepa Papan was going to be on this week's show, but she's actually on next week's show. So, uh, Deborah Yepa Papan, Colleen, do you know Deborah? Yeah, I, I think that I, I do. Okay, so I think we've yeah, been I think in, in, all know Deborah. She works at the field. Yeah, she works mm -hmm. at the field, and her position is um, uh, she is she's not working on repatriation efforts. Um, is it community engagement or community? Um, <laughs> Deborah does her Deborah's title is like community outreach or something. I yeah, think. Oh. she's working with the native community, and she's been helping with the new. Uh, uh, indigenous exhibits there to kind of redo the field. Um, uh, so we'll have some interesting questions for her next week. Um, and hopefully Roy will be back with us. I know his schedule is changing because his work commitments and family commitments are increasing. Um, so we may need a new co-host. As I look out to my uh, the, the the chat window and, and all of you all out there, hey, where's the next <laughs> co-host? Um, so if you'd like to, maybe I should put out an audition, River. What do you think? An audition for a new co-host? Sure, or a reality competition show <laughs> called Are You the Next Red Hoop Talk Host? <laughs> and, and and we'll put out the the um, the flyer for it. Let's see the the great benefits of being the co-host of, of Red Hoop Talk. You work for free. <laughs> You're spending your late night hours on Sunday evening doing the show that may last from an hour to three hours long. Um, uh, you put up with um, sometimes some interesting chat happening, um, and you know staying awake. It, it's not too bad of a job. It hasn't been too bad, has it? No, it was really lovely tonight, yeah. Oh, good. good, mm -hmm. good. Well, I really appreciate y'all uh, spending your Sunday evenings with us and doing this. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. It was very relaxing and comfortable. Oh, Lance is saying a uh, uh, talent show. So maybe we'll have a uh, uh, write this down, or we'll have some kind of like open talking circle co-host talent show, kind of like a, uh, what is that, America's Got Talent? Um, <laughs> or something for, for, I'm not quite sure how we'll do that. We'll, we'll figure this out. Um, yeah, JD can work without his video on. He, 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 he doesn't want anyone to see his face. He has Scott's tape over his camera. So no one can see who JD is. He's a mystery. <laughs> He's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in something else. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm starting to get um, uh, slap happy. So that means I'm tired and, and uh, um, uh, thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you, River. Um, our, um, our Red Hoop Talk was brought to you by, everyone say one, two, three, the- The Association on American Indian, American Indian Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, everyone. We got we to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> work on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and, and call it a night. Thank you. Thanks to all of those who joined us on the chat and um, who joined us out there in, in Facebook, Twitter, and, and YouTube land. Um, come see us next week with um, Deborah Yepapa Pan, who is Korean and uh, hey, Hamas Pueblo. She's from Hamas. Um, all right. We'll see you all next week. Take it easy. Thank you. Have a good night. Everyone. Good night. I'm pushing the